Now we're going to go into a story that actually uses and very specifically talks about nihilism, but in an entirely new way. So now we get to know, do another quick biography. Checking my watch and making sure that we're good because I can't see that thing back there. It's a fucking okay, chaos. I can barely see it. All right. Mary Flannery O'Connor, 1925 to 1964, is American novelist, short story writer, essayist. She wrote two novels and 30, 32 short stories, as well as a number of commentaries and articles, scholarly articles in particular. Uh, she wrote in what became known as the Southern Gothic style, that is her short stories and her novel, novels. Um, she was part of actually that movement. People that we think of in that movement are um, Truman Capote, uh, William Faulkner, um, who else? I listed somebody else in there I know. Uh, Tennessee Williams, Tennessee Williams, Cat and Hot Tin Rough, right? This angry, bleak sort of style. So she writes kind of in that style. And what th one of the things that style is known for is these overdrawn characters. You know, the, uh, the, um, the people that are bigger than life and, and intentionally drawn that way. Um, and then also something grotesque. There's always something grotesque, either about the characters themselves, the things that they do, or something in the story. And that's the gothic part of it. There's always a, an element of the grotesque. What, what is the element of the grotesque here in this story? Think about what happens up in the loft. And what does he want? He wants to see where her prosthetic goes onto her leg. He's fascinated with the missing leg. He's... He's got a weird, like, prosthetic fetish. And then we find out later he stole a glass eye from somebody else. And he's also stealing her glasses. He's got this weird fetish about stealing people's prosthetics, things that they need to just live a semi-normal life, right? So he's, he's really kind of a sicko. That's the grotesque to me. That is the grotesque element in this story is uh, manly, <laughs> which is great. Oh, yes, and also violence. There's almost always some element of either direct or emotional violence in the, in the Southern Gothic style. Okay, she was a devout Catholic. Now, here we have where it becomes a stark polar opposite to Hemingway. Hemingway the nihilist. Hemingway the all is nothing. Hemingway, life is just a roll of the dice. Versus a devout Catholic who wrote more than 100 book reviews for two Catholic newspapers in Georgia. By the, by the way, these were Diocesan new, uh, newspapers. These were actual newspapers of the local diocese, right? So this wasn't like just for a local newspaper. Um, her reviews consistently confronted theological and ethical themes in books written by the most serious and demanding theologians of her time. This is no shallow girl. She is a very deep thinking woman. And she thinks deeply about things theological, about things in life. She has a sardonic wit. She, and you see it come through in a lot of her writing. And you see a lot when you, when you read you know, interviews and things with her. She, was, she had a sharp wit and didn't mind just kind of you know, turning it in just a little bit on people. But at the same time, there's a goodness and there's a kindness to her. She's just a really a striking individual. A prayer journal O'Connor kept during her time at the University of Iowa was published in 2013. It included prayers, ruminations on faith and writing, and her relationship with God. In other words, she was journaling before journaling was cool. She was journaling about her faith um, as a, a part of her part of her daily life when she was a very young woman. She was diagnosed with lupus at the age of 15, and lupus is what killed her father. How do you know what lupus is? Who can tell me what, uh, is this a really bad disease? In its extreme forms, it is a horrible, horrible way to die. One of the most painful afflictions you can have. One of the primary symptoms of lupus is overall body pain that never goes away. Rashes that just spring up and, and it just can't be healed. Joint, joint pain, brittleness of the bones. These are all things that she had to deal with and she had watched her father dealing with him until he died. 
Now that's the kind of thing, if we talk about how Hemingway was turned sour on life because of the things he saw in war, she saw tragedy and suffering and felt it in her own body, and yet she never departs from God. And yet in her life, she remains steadfastly devoted to her faith. And everything she does throughout her life, all of her stories, there is an underpinning of her faith in all of that work. Um, I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but she was really into peacocks. Uh, it's just a side issue. It's just interesting. I don't know of anybody else who had a big, you know, love of peacocks, but she had over 40 peacocks on her farm. Actually, at one point, someone asked her how many. She says, last time I counted, there were over 40, but I'm afraid to take a census anymore because there's just so many of them. You know, it's just like, I don't even want to tell you how many there are because it's embarrassing. Because what are they good for? Nothing. They're just pretty. They're beautiful, and that's really their only value. Uh, and that kind of says something about her, doesn't it? That she just loves these things solely for being beautiful. Now you notice in both of these pictures, if you look closely, she's wearing her crutches. She has those crutches with the arm supports because she's so fragile that she can't walk without them or she's liable to break a hip. All right, so now let's get to the story itself. Good country people. At this point, you should start to see some notes on your page. All right, yes, you have six blanks in which to write these six names as we discuss them. All right, so the six characters, Mrs. Hopewell, a divorcee, owner of a farm, and the mother of Joy slash Hulga. Joy, Hulga, Hopewell. Um, Mrs. Hopewell's 32-year-old daughter with a PhD and a wooden leg. Yes, they aren't necessarily, you know, combined. I mean, you can get the PhD without the wooden leg and vice versa, but... I just thought that was funny the way they wrote that. Anyway, uh, yes, she has a PhD in a wooden leg. Mrs. Freeman. Mrs. Freeman is uh, the woman who lives next door, and she works for Hopewell as a tenant farmer. Tenant farmer. Now, this, I think, is important. We start talking about the symbolism in this story. She's a tenant farmer. You live on the property, and in exchange for living on, having this place to live, you work the fields, and you get food, and maybe a little bit of money. What does that sound like? Slavery. Sounds an awful lot like slavery, doesn't it? And yet, what is her name? Freeman. I don't know. I think that there's a bit of irony intended in that. Um, no, I do know. I, I absolutely do know. It's, it's intended to be ironic. Uh, Glenise Freeman, her daughter, 18 years old, with many admirers. Okay, she's very proud of her daughter's, the fact that her daughter is popular and has many admirers. Uh, Kara Mae Freeman, her other daughter, 15, but married and pregnant. So again, married at 15, not that unusual in the Old South. She is portraying the era in her time, the time and place that she's living in and writing in. Okay, the next character, Manly Pointer. Manly is his first name. <laughs> How is he described? Yeah, he's not described as a manly character. He's described as scrawny. Not just skinny, but scrawny. Small and scrawny. And he lugs around this case of Bibles and, is, and he struggles with it because he's a, he's a scrawny, weak guy. He has a hard time doing anything, right? So he's not a very manly character. So once again, the name appears to be more ironic, but maybe there's more to it than that too. And Pointer, why? Why would you call his name Pointer, do you think? Hmm. We'll get back to that too. All right, everybody done writing these? I hope you are. Moving on. All right. What makes, when I say good country people, I've noticed it's all small letters. I'm not talking about the the story, talking about the people. When you refer to good country people, what makes them good? What's good about people, these good country people? You might use the phrase salt of the earth or uh, good common folk, right? My guess would be they're good workers. Okay, so we, we have assumptions. They're good workers. They may be in a bad situation, but they'll always work hard. What else? 
What else do good country folk think about other good country folk? How do they perceive what makes someone good country people? Humble. Humble, Humble is definitely a part of it. What else? Law abiding. Law abiding. They'll be honest. So honest. Humble, hardworking, these are the kind of attributes that we assume from good country people. Jumping ahead a little bit in your minds, again, I'm going through this with the assumption that you've read the story. So, which characters do you see portraying these traits? Who is honest in this story? Is Mrs. Hopewell honest? Is she, is she ever dishonest? No, I mean, we never see her do anything that's dishonest. And in fact, her whole life is poured into... Uh, trying to honestly make a better life for her daughter. So, yeah, she's honest. Is she hardworking? She herself, as the owner of the farm, at the end of the story, she's out there digging up onions. She's out there doing difficult, smelly work. Um, yeah, so she's hardworking. Um, is she humble? Yeah, I mean, she, she's like the epitome, epitome of humility. Multiple times through here, oh, I'm not much myself. I don't ever, I, you know, I... That's kind of the way she responds to things. Well, don't look at me. I'm nobody important, right? That's how she kind of perceives herself. So, yeah, I think that she is good country people, and she loves to use the phrase, but she embodies it. What makes bad people bad? When you think of bad people, people who don't fall into that category of good country people, what makes them not good country people? Laziness, just the, okay, let's just think this through. Just the opposite of what we just talked about, right? So laziness as opposed to hardworking. Dishonest as opposed to law-abiding. Cruel. Uh, cruelty is definitely something that we would put in there. Yeah, and we didn't actually put in uh, niceness or, or um, thinking of others, but that is definitely something that would have been under good country people. And yes, the cruelty that we see Manly exhibit at the end, yeah, that's something that is the antithesis of being good country people. So other than Manly, do we see any of those characteristics shown? Who else exhibits some of those characteristics? Holga, Holga. She treats her mother horribly. She utilizes her, you know, she has a, a, an, an infirmity, you know, the missing leg, and also her heart infirmity. But she, you get the sense that she kind of uses these things as an excuse not to work. She's not a real hardworking person either. She's not a sympathetic person. She is not a giving person. She's not a respectful person. Okay, so she's very much not what we would put into the category of this, what makes good people good.